Hi, good evening. The three of us are going to be speaking about the implications of counterparty credit exposure having both an uncertain magnitude as well as having uncertainty, depending on where the market is, of creating either an asset or a liability. I'll cover some of the basics, and then uh, David and Charles will go into the two of the aspects of this in more depth. <coughs> so we know that uh, the potential exposure over time with a single OTC derivative is uncertain. It's contingent on how the market changes over time. So a trivial example that you've probably all seen before, today I were to buy pound sterling two years forward at $1.50 a pound, and this was one of the random paths that the exchange rate might take over time, and here I focused on the spot exchange rate to make the example simpler, then if that were the path the market followed over time, this would be the value of the contract. And since in this context we're focused on credit exposure, the ex I would only look at the states of the world where I had positive exposure, so I would say here's my exposure profile, my credit exposure profile to that counterparty. But be aware, there's also states of the world in this example where I would owe the counterparty and have a liability. That's only one of, of course, many possible paths. If we look at thousands of paths, we can arrive at a statistical distribution of the potential exposures, given some assumptions about the statistical distribution of changes in market rates and given the nature of the contract. So again, this should all be very familiar. If I have a forward contract, I can describe the potential exposure at either a very high confidence level or a moderately high confidence level, or I can measure the expected positive exposure. And if I had an interest rate swap, I'd have three similar curves at different levels of confidence. Uh, and the reason for the Sydney Opera House shape curve rather than this simple curve, of course, is that a swap has periodic cash flows that settle over time. Just as I could have looked in these three cases at the potential asset that I could have. I also could have had a potential liability and I could have done a similar analysis. And of course, we typically, firms typically don't <coughs> enter into one transaction with a counterparty. They have many transactions. They need to model the potential exposure arising from those many transactions. That's complicated to do because not only do you have to simulate all the changes that can occur in market rates, you have to take into account the legal netting and margin agreements that one has with counterparty and what effect that will have on potential exposure. If you take all of that into account, you can simulate a counterparty's exposure profile over time. And again, you can do it at a high confidence <coughs> level or you can measure the expected positive exposure, the average amount the counterparty would owe you only looking at states of the world where you have an asset and taking states of the world where you have a liability as zero. Or, once again, you could look at this from the other perspective and measure your potential liability to the counterparty. The, uh, so far I used this concept of uh, expected positive exposure and as you'll see in the remaining part of the lecture, we'll also talk about expected negative exposure. EPE and ENE, -E. and just for precision, let me define those terms for you. If we do a simulation of one path the market could take, then at any point in time, for my exposure to the counterparty, the expected positive exposure at that point in time for that simulation will be the result of summing over several different terms. It'll, I'll have to take into account all of the netting margin sets I have with the counterparty. I might have, because I might deal with the counterparty over a number of jurisdictions, separate sets of contracts that can be legally netted together and have a margin agreement. So in my simulation of what my exposure might be at a future time, I not only have to take into account the potential value of the contracts, but I would also in principle have to simulate the amount of margin the, the counterparty would be legally required to post and measure what that simulated difference would be, as well as I'd have to sum over all 
netting sets that had no margin, as well as all contracts which I, for which I had neither netting or margin. If I did that, and then I, sit, I did the simulation over thousands or tens of thousands of tabs that the market could follow, I can average over each point in time that number and I would get an EPE profile. <coughs> So essentially, this is the average of all states of the world at any point in time where I have an asset where I'd be treating the liability as zero. And I can do the opposite. I can, for that same simulation, instead of this function, I can measure the expected <coughs> liability I have with exactly the same formula, except I'm substituting a min for a max. So I'd look at all values that have a negative value where I owe the counterparty, taking into account margin agreements or netting agreements or contracts <coughs> that had neither margin or netting. And then if I averaged at any point in time, I could measure an ENE, an expected negative <coughs> exposure. But this may seem like a rather esoteric thing to measure. Why not simply measure exposure at the one chance in a hundred? But as you'll see, as this will be discussed, these are actually very useful quantities that need to be measured if one wants to know one's uh, credit risk to the counterparty. In fact, why measure EPE or ENE? Why not simply measure potential exposure, for example, at the 99th percentile confidence level? Because these measures play many different roles in our analysis of risk. We need to measure the potential assets that we could have at different confidence levels. One, to measure the potential credit exposure to the counterparty at a high confidence level, so perhaps 99 percentile, much more than EPE. <coughs> we need to calculate the potential margin the counterparty might have to post to us, just to know whether we've entered into a, a number of contracts such that under stressful conditions, the amount of margin the counterparty might have to post would be beyond his liquidity capability of posting that amount of margin. We need to know EPE as one of the components of calculating economic capital. You could think of it as the loan equivalent EPE times a thump, uh, parameter called alpha, which we can have a separate lecture on. Is, one of the, is the, basically the loan equivalent for calculating economic capital and it's also been adopted by Basel II as the appropriate measure for economic capital. We also <coughs> need this concept of EPE, as you'll see, as one of the components in calculating the credit value adjustment for counterparty risk, which as I'll explain in a few minutes, is the credit risk premium the difference between the market value of a derivative portfolio discounting all future cash flows at LIBOR and the actual value when you take into account the credit risk you have that the counterparty might not perform. So this calculation of this credit value adjustment has as one of its components EPE. We also need to know what this potential exposure is, not only for measuring credit <coughs> risk, but as Charles will discuss, in order to know what the potential assets we might have that will need to be funded, because balance sheets have to balance. If we have assets, we have to know and plan on how we'll fund those assets. We want to measure the potential liability at different confidence levels for several reasons as well. One is we need to know our own liquidity risk if we have a margin agreement because the potential negative exposure, negative exposure at a high confidence level, enables us to know how much margin we might have to post and enables us to know what liquidity consequences of that agreement will be. And as you'll see, David speaks, any e is also a component of what's called the bilateral CBA, which again is uh, needed to measure the credit value adjustment of the mark-to-market value of a portfolio of derivatives, taking into account the credit risk of the counterparty we have the derivatives with. So as you can see, measuring potential positive exposure or potential negative exposure at different confidence levels plays a very important role in measuring exposure, 
in measuring <coughs> uh, marked market value of a derivative portfolio, adjusting for the credit risk of the counterparty, and in measuring the amount of liquidity risk you could have, liquidity risk the counterparty could have, and the potential assets that you'll need to fund. So before turning this over to David, let me give a little bit of background information on what the CVA is, beyond simply saying it's the credit value adjustment to take into account the credit risk of a counterparty. The way of thinking about this is to first think about how this is done for a simple bond. If, I guess the first question one could ask is, if credit, the credit spread or the risk rating of a counterparty were irrelevant in how we mark to market the value of a portfolio with that counterparty, then there would be no credit value adjustment. Now, in, in fact, if you go back 15 years ago, that was how most commercial banks mark to market their derivative portfolios. They, <coughs> cap, they had various processes that calculated expected future cash flows. Those expected future cash flows were discounted to present value at LIBOR, and that was it. It didn't matter whether one had a derivative counterparty that was AAA or, which wasn't likely uh, 10 or 15 years ago, double B or single B. It didn't matter what the rating or what the credit spread of the counterparty was. In the past, the commercial banks marked to market their derivative portfolios by discounting all future cash flows at LIBOR. There wasn't any adjustment for the credit risk of the counterparty. That no longer is the case. And I think investment banks were the first to realize that they did need to take into account the credit risk of the counterparty. So the question is, how do you take that credit risk into account? And the way of thinking about it is first to review how it's done for a bond. A way of thinking about this is if I had a bond or a loan I was marking to market, I could measure its market value as the present value of future cash flows discounted at a risk-free rate minus a risk premium. The risk premium is the difference between the risk-free value of the security and the value it has as a consequence of the default risk of the issuer. And of course, since in a bond, all of the cash flows are positive, I'll be receiving all those cash flows, calculating a credit risk premium is equivalent to discounting the cash flows at a spread to the risk-free rate. Of course, the spread includes other things other than credit risk, but it's a trivial exercise to do to derive the result that the risk premium, assuming the spread only captured credit risk, is simply given by this formula. Now you might think, well, okay, if I have a portfolio of derivatives and I mark them to market, I guess I should discount their expected future cash flows by spread to LIBOR. And that would be, you might think, be the analogy of how to take the credit risk of the counterparty into account. But that would be a mistake for a number of reasons. A simple example, if I do a swap today with a counterparty, suppose I had an enormous swap, you know, $500 million 10-year swap and a flat yield curve, all future cash flows, expected cash flows, would be zero. And if I discounted them at a spread to LIBOR, I still would have zero. So there's a problem with just Assuming the answer to the question of how to measure counterparty risk is simply by adding a spread to the discounting of all the future cash flows. Instead, you need to take into account the following. In order to calculate the credit risk premium, you have to perform a portfolio analysis. You can't look at simply one transaction. You have to take into account all the legal netting and margin agreements. And as we described how exposure is measured, in measuring the credit risk premium, you need to do it on a portfolio basis. You need to take into account the uncertain nature of the future exposure. It's very different than a bond where you have cash flows that are contractually set and you're simply discounting them at a spread. You have to first estimate what those expected future cash flows will be. And then you have to take into account, you have to evaluate the significance, if any, of the bilateral nature of counterparty exposure. 
In my swap example, if I enter into this large swap with the counterparty, then depending on how conditional on where the market is in the future, that swap could be an asset or a liability to me, which means I could have credit risk to the counterparty, or the counterparty had, could have credit risk to me. And how do you take into, effect, into account that each of us has this potential credit exposure to another, to the other? How is that taken into account in calculating the credit risk premium? So as you can see, it's a much more complicated problem than it is for a bond. Like a bond, we can define the credit risk premium or the derivative as simply the sum of the mark-to-market value <coughs> discounted at a risk-free rate minus the CVA, where the CVA, by definition, is what we mean by the credit risk premium. The question then is, how is the CVA defined? So we know that, just from everything I've said so far, it should be calculated on a portfolio basis, and it needs to take into account potential future exposure, and it needs to take into account all of the legal agreements, such as margin and netting, that can affect potential future exposure. I think the first uh, paper written on this was written by Kerry Bollier and Eric Sorensen uh, some years ago in the 80s, and essentially their idea has taken hold. There's, there's two perspectives on how the CBA can be calculated. One is a unilateral perspective where I only take into account my potential credit exposure to the counterparty. The other is a bilateral CBA in which I take into account that each of us has potential credit exposure to the other. So in the unilateral CBA, and then we'll go into what this means, the CBA is simply this single quantity. How much credit exposure might I have to the counterparty in the bilateral CBA, I look at the difference between my potential credit risk premium to the counterparty and the counterparty's potential credit risk premium to me. So the first term is calculated based on my potential asset, and the second term is calculated based on my potential liability, and in this case I'm looking at the difference in the cost of credit. You could think of it as my cost of credit given the potential asset I have, the counterparty's potential cost of credit given the potential asset he has, and my spread. So in more detail, if I do a simulation of EPE, the expected asset I'll have over time, I can derive the value for the CBA positive as the EPE in each forward period times the forward spread of the counterparty times the period of time discounted to present value. One thing I've left out here, a more exact calculation would have also taken into account the survival rate, the fact that the conditional on the counterparty not defaulting in this forward period, what's the likelihood of him being around in the next forward period, so there should be an extra term there, but for simplicity, I've left that out. And similarly, I could simulate the potential liability I have, which if the counterparty and I are agreeing on volatilities and, and correlations and market rates, would be the potential <coughs> asset of the counterparty. And for the CBA on the liability side, the CBA for the payable I might have, I would calculate the expected negative exposure I have and then I would use my own current <coughs> spread, not the counterparty spread, in that forward period, times the interval discounted to present value. One thing I haven't said, and Charles will talk more about this, possibly David will also, is, well, which spread? Should I be using my bond spread or my CDS spread? Should I be using my, for when I look at the spread of either my firm or the counterparty, what spread should I use? Because we have two different spreads available, bond spreads and CDS spreads, which is the one that's most appropriate? I'll leave that as an open question which will be discussed. Um, I have a simple example, but in the interest of time, let me skip it and end with, with focusing on the following. The fact that the CVA can be uh, calculated by doing a simulation means it can also, and it's being simulated in terms of market rates, means it also can be hedged by 
identifying all of the market factors that affect its value, like by identifying its sensitivity to changes in base rates that will affect potential exposure, or its sensitivity to changes in credit spreads, which will also affect its value. So you can see now that there's actually two ways of looking at this. One is a more traditional way, in which one would say the market value of the counterparty's portfolio has one component that is the traditional mark-to-market value of the derivative portfolio, and that's market risk, and a second component that traditionally is looked at as credit risk. And this bifurcation of the total value into a market risk and a credit risk component is actually very similar, if you think about it, to the traditional way of looking at a loan book. Because normally when a commercial bank looks at its loan portfolio, it bifurcates the total risk of the loan portfolio into an interest rate risk component, ALM risk of the asset and liability portfolio, and a credit risk. So there's a sense of you know, splitting that risk into these two components, market and credit. And that's the traditional way of looking at derivatives, the derivative counterparty risk. And if one does that, one would have to hedge by transferring the credit risk to a third party by buying either a CDS or a contingent credit default swap. But there's an alternate way of looking at this, which is to say, just as I can look at uh, a loan from this perspective of accrual interest rate risk and credit risk, if that loan were in a trading portfolio, I would sim and it was a traded loan or a traded bond, all I have is market risk, including the credit component of market <coughs> risk. So from a market risk perspective, both terms can be viewed as market risk, and the CVA can be hedged as just market risk. So from that perspective, you wouldn't have something called counterparty credit risk. You would just have the CVA component of market risk. And David will speak about how that can be hedged. So I will now uh, pass this on to David. I had a few more slides, but <coughs> in the interest of time, let me pass it on to him. So that's the foundation, that you have counterparty exposure gives rise to both assets and liabilities. You need to measure that for a variety of reasons. The CBA is, can be viewed as either a counterparty credit risk hedged in the traditional way, or it can be viewed as a component of market risk, in which case it can be hedged. David will, will describe to you how it can be hedged. having not put a lot more formulas in my presentation next to Evans, but uh, we'll get by by waving my hands and the like. <laughs> I think Evan has uh, outlined very simply why we have to have a CBA, but I'll, I'll review that a bit. Why bilateral? What about funding? Um, why hedge, how we can think about hedging our, our counterparty aspect of this, how we can think about hedging our own credit curve that's input into the CBA, and how we can think about um, hedging the underlying markets that drive the, the credit exposure that we have in the first place. Then I think the, the more interesting thing I, I have to say is, is the second last, is, is sort of thinking about some, some boundaries of what our hedging activities look like in extreme events. And fortunately, the last six months has sort of <clears throat> driven this, this home uh, quite well in, in what, you know, what one's intuition around what the, the hedges that you have on the book should, should look like and what they're really accomplishing. Um, most of my talk is, should be thought of in the context of a fairly simple portfolio. So no margining, uh, no, meaning, you know, no um, 
complicated transactions, you know, vanilla CDS, vanilla interest rate swaps, cross currency, that sort of thing. One one netting agreement, uh, and, and then we'll talk about um, what one can do or what one may want to do for margin names or names where there is no CDS or, or bond market to speak of. The, the simple starting point for, for valuing, for, for having a CBA is you, you have an asset on your books that has to be valued correctly. You, you can dream up fairly easily how you could construct cash flows that look exactly like a corporate bond that if you discount them at LIBOR, you will get something well in excess of what that corporate bond is worth. So the, the goal here as far as valuing the asset is really to make sure that you tie out with some, some base cases such as the value of a corporate bond. And, and I'm not gonna, whether one should be discounted, whether one should be looking at corporate bond spreads or CDS spreads, I would argue in most cases you should be trying to look to the most liquid market, and which is presumably the most transparent to get that right. right. We, can, we can chat about that. As far as the, the unilateral or, or bilateral view of the world, one of, one of the interesting things that, that Evan didn't mention with the, the Bollier Sorensen example is Solomon Brothers was forced into recognizing the, the CBA from a bilateral point of view because they were getting picked off in the market. This was nothing about you know, trying to manage credit risk correctly. This was traders were selling assets at 90 cents on, on the dollar and it should have been 80. And that's, you know, that was the mad scramble to figure out what was going on. I think there is a, a healthy debate that's, that is taking place about where should this bilateral view of the world begin and end. Uh, if one cannot, and it, it's difficult at best to lock in that value or hedge that value, um, I think it is a, a healthy debate as to, to how much of that should flow through the books and records. In the very least, however, one needs to know what that number is to avoid getting picked off. Without, without knowing that, you're, you're just setting yourself up. One, one interesting thing is that people have often argued the benefit of the, the mean negative exposure, MNE or ENE, um, from a funding point of view, and argued that the expected liability is a, a massive funding benefit, but then at the same time ignored the, the cost of funding the asset on the other side and sort of said we just you know we'll just stick with the bilateral view and that's it, um, which which obviously does not uh, finish the, the the question. And, and it, as far as how one should or can incorporate funding costs in this in this pricing, uh, to me feels very similar to to how the world felt five six years ago when we were arguing about bilateral CBAs and the accounting world had no idea whether we should be doing this and different firms were, were had put it in place and different firms, other firms were struggling with the different elements of it. And, and as far as what we do with this funding cost, what we, you know, once we can, we can calculate it fairly easily, where you put it in your, in your financial statements I think is a different, uh, a different issue. <coughs> Why hedge is, uh, is, is, is it, I guess the only reason this is an interesting question is if you look at a lot of people's quarterly results, it appears that a lot of firms have chosen not to. There has been quarterly hits in the, in the billions uh, for people's monoline exposure. And, and that's, I guess, just because those numbers are large enough that they, they felt they had to disclose them. So, and, and and, and clearly some of these numbers that are coming out in the financial statements suggest that this, these numbers are not being calculated um, on a CBA desk or even on a, on a trading floor. It looks like something more coming out of the CFO's office where they've just taken the exposure and multiplied it by one minus the recovery and so there we go. Um, 
hedging, hedging the CV, CVA can, can allow you to do a lot of things other than just reduce your P&L volatility. Um, <coughs> one, one can look at it just as limiting the P&L impact from various scenarios. One, one can worry entirely about the, the jump to default scenario or massive spread widening, massive spread tightening and, and have a, a much more simplistic view on hedging than, than attempting to, to hedge every uh, you know, 10 basis point move in, in spreads or the like. One interesting thing, if you, if you look at how different firms tackle this, is, again, it seems at times like the, the CBA is coming out of the CFO's office or, or is calculated by controllers or, or what have you, and it, it's far away from anyone that would own the P&L on the hedges. And this, this obviously is, is just politically not going to work. The, the, not to say that you need to have a, a central location, but if the, the owner of the CBA is not the, the owner of the P&L and the hedges, you're sort of, I think, doomed to fail. And I think we, we see uh, a number of firms that sort of either have a centralized view or, or desk by desk that, that works, as long as the, the owner of the P&L on both sides are, are the same person. For hedging, the counterparty credit, as Evan illustrated, one, one can, under the assumption of a zero correlation between the underlying trades and the counterparty spread, separate the problem into a calculation of exposure and the impact of the, the credit <coughs> spread. Um, the, the impact of the credit spread doesn't quite I don't think should come quite through as, as simply um, as, as Evan <coughs> illustrated. I, I, would, I would argue that the, the calculation should be slightly different to the extent that one should uh, cook or convert the quoted credit curve into, into incremental periods of default and, and, and take that into account with the assumed recovery that is associated with the credit curve as well. There, there is a a very real recovery uh, de uh, dependence on the value of the CVA. But once one has uh, separated the problem, into, because the problem is separable under the zero correlation assumption, it's fairly simple and straightforward to calculate as many credit partials as you would like to the quoted credit curve that you want to hedge. Now, this doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to see liquidity anywhere on, on any but a few of the points on that credit curve, but it at least knows what you're trying to do. If you, if you really should be buying seven-year protection, but you can only buy five, at least you know you should probably be buying a little more than you, you would have thought. And at least you then know that you probably don't have a lot of jump to default risk because you're, you're, you're presumably buying more notional than you, you would have if you had a, a more complete market with uh, CDS along every tenor point. <coughs> and again, generally because you, you can't, because the market won't really let you nail this down fully, generally one, uh, as with any, I, I think, exotics book, sort of one hedges to a number of scenarios. Obviously with, with poor counterparties uh, or stressed counterparties, one, one wants to, uh, be concerned with the jump to default risk, and for in in the the rest of the book, really focusing on on uh, hedging to spread moves, whether that's a, a relative uh, something like a PV 10% move or or just a parallel shift in the credit curve, either one is probably going to get you uh, fairly close to where you want to be. As far as hedging the the bilateral piece, the the or the the liability piece of, of the CBA, and unfortunately the market, the, the natural hedge that you would like to do is self protection on yourself. 
which unfortunately no one is going to pay anything for. So, so the natural hedge is sort of taken off the, off the table. One can sell protection on other entities that look a lot like you. Um, unfortunately, that can end in, in tears, as I know of at least one CBA trader that sort of lost his job due to Lehman bonds that he was holding as a hedge to his enemy. Uh, clearly here, hedging the jump to default risk is not a problem you're going to concern yourself with. But you, so you may be able to, to hedge uh, relatively well um, by, by selling forward starting protection, you know, selling 10 year, buying one year of the same notional and actually having spread sensitivity uh, there against the, the M&E losses that you may see if your spreads come in. And, and this, this element of things that has been uh, also very real in uh, the last batch, the last couple batches of quarterly earnings that have come out, a lot of a very real value has ended up on, on the books. I think Charles will uh, speak more whether he thinks that should have happened or, or not, but it did, and that's you know the current guidance that I think we're getting from an accounting point of view. As I mentioned earlier, I mentioned in passing that the CBA is really no no different than any other exotic book that that a derivatives firm uh, will have. You you've got a, a bunch of things driving the valuation, and as best you can, you need to understand how that how it's affected. And, and obviously, one starts very simply with understanding sensitivities to to simple changes in the exchange rates. Simple changes in interest, <coughs> interest rates, both full curve shifts and partials. And, and hopefully one gets some intuition around that so when the model starts spitting out odd things, one has a clue what's going on. One of the, one of the interesting um, trades that, that causes some, some interesting <coughs> results is, is just a simple forward starting swap. If you have a swap that's going to start in 10 years and go for 10 years, it, it shouldn't have and doesn't have a lot of interest rate sensitivity just for a parallel move. But because, of you, because you can think of that swap as a 20-year swap going one way and a 10-year swap going another way, the partials are actually massive. And the partials <coughs> are, uh, be, because the CBA is for the MPE, or both of them are floored at, at zero, the partials will often not add up anywhere close to what the parallel move is. And, and if you, you don't see that one coming, you're, you're, you can sort of flabbergast you. If, if one does have a book with where non-zero correlation um, is a dangerous assumption, you can think of um, uh, foreign uh, cross-currency swaps with sovereigns, for example, or any credit product, really, given how credit spreads seem to move uh, move together, any, any credit product with just about any counterparty that isn't, uh, isn't margined uh, is, is going to suggest that the correlations are not zero and one has to do some sort of uh, simulation embedding all the underlying um, market factors as well as changes in the, in the counterparty credit uh, spread. And so obviously one of these things that one would like is to stress that correlation. And even if one, even if one does believe the correlation <coughs> is zero, I think it's a, a prudent thing to understand how sensitive you are to that assumption and understand what, how much the book would change in value. Uh, similarly for the, the vols, that, that drives the underlying uh, interest rate or, or FX <coughs> simulation. Typically, I don't think these are, are large with the, the type of large books we're, we're talking about, but still it's something that uh, is useful to know. The other interesting thing with, with credit products is unlike <coughs> sort of concluding that 
your for a, a major bank focusing on you know G10 currencies, G10 interest rates probably gets you you know 90 percent of your risk or, or more in the in the credit space with with you know a few dozen uh, curves you, you haven't even started to touch on the, the you know one of the investment grade indices. So I think there's there's a a large challenge in trying to understand how to uh, perform a uh, a small but meaningful number of stresses in the in the credit space. Now, fortunately, I think the the universe here of unmargined uh, credit default swaps uh, with risky counterparties is fairly small. So it, it's uh, perhaps something that one can get their arms around uh, in a different way. One way of, of, I think, thinking through the hedges required on a, by, with a CBA is to sort of think through the end game. If the counterparty <coughs> is about to, or it's, it's certain that they're they're going to default. So if if the counterparty is is literally about to default, so you know, let's say the recovery's assumed to be 20 or marked at 20, there may even be a market at that, and the, 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 the credit default swaps for you know, some short period of time are, are trading at 80% up front, and for whatever reason the, the, the recovery is zero, sorry, the, it's clear that the CVA is just the entire value of the trades. You, you have nothing there on the other side, you know, this counterparty might as well not exist. And here, the, the, the CBA, because the CBA is the CE, the current exposure, all the Greeks flow through the equal sign as well. So clearly, all of your hedging is just fully and completely unwinding the primary desk's hedge. Now, if we, we throw in a recovery element to that, the, you, you, you still have some amount of money that's going to come out of the counterparty when they default. So now, instead of hedging the full notional, if you like, of the underlying trades, you're going to be hedging something like one minus the recovery of the notional. And to sort of complete the picture, one can think that if, if default is not quite imminent, then, then the CVA will be a little less then one minus the recovery times the CE. And to cover that little less is what you would need uh, credit default protection <coughs> and the counterparty to cover up as, a, as a, this factor of K increases to one. The, the interesting thing is in the, the previous example, it almost suggests you should be buying protection when default is imminent, so you'll lose the proper amount of money if, if K sort of comes down from one. For margined names, and, and, and here for the moment assume that we, we're not talking about any meaningful thresholds or minimum transfer amounts, the, the whole logic behind calculating a CVA I think still exists. Uh, unfortunately, it's a lot more subjective. The, whether you have three days or three weeks of gap risk uh, it, it is anyone's best guess. Obviously, the, the tightest would, would depend on the, the actual language in the ISDA, but, but the behavior of the firm should presumably play a role there. The, the hedging <coughs> of that CBA, personally, I don't think makes a lot of sense. If one really wants to spend money in that area, it probably makes more sense to tighten up the operations to make sure that you actually have the right amount of money in your place or theirs. And, and so you to tighten the gap risk as, as much as possible. The the other obviously obvious challenges are counterparties that have no no debt or CDS. And, and so here obviously your hedging instruments are, are limited at best. And there the only goal really is to to mark the book as appropriately as possible with, with 
counterparty proxies or, or things of, of that nature. That's, uh, that's it. And Charles is now, I think, going to speak more on the funding element that I sort of alluded to. And I think where a lot of interesting conversations are going to happen uh, going forward. statistically defined, but that doesn't make them any less real in their um, future evolution. And just to say the obvious, the long-term receivables require funding with long-term debt, and long-term payables provide funding as a source of long-term debt. So in some sense, derivative receivables and payables don't act a lot differently than the balance sheet. And a great way to think about them for con convenience is to think of the EPE as a non-interest earning asset that the firm has to support, and ENE as a non-interest earning liability that the firm has to support. And you have to sort of think about what the economics of those are today. Now, it used to be that those economics were pretty simple because the firm's uh, uh, cost of funding was very, very cheap. You know, when, uh, when your debt is selling at 10 basis points over a LIBOR, these kind of things turn into a round off because people don't function, don't focus on that, but with today's wider debt spread, the economics of receivables and payables has become substantially larger than it used to be, and we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, let's just go into a simple example and make the point. We have two back-to-back -back transactions, and we're just going to arbitrarily say if the market goes up by some quantity Q, which is going to be over 50%, now it's going to go down by that amount. And if it goes up, counterparty number one is going to owe us money. And if it, if it goes down, uh, the offsetting uh, thing will occur. And we've got back-to-back -back transactions with counterparties one and two. So a simple kind of binomial world, two <coughs> offsetting trades. We're kind of out of, the, out of it. We're in the, in the middle here. And we can see uh, laid out here, if the market rises by X, uh, counterparty one will owe us $100. But counterparty number two, hundred dollars to them. Uh, those uh, essentially earnings and losses of these individual trades will have dividends. You might say, quote, dividends on them, and that will generate the necessary cash flows. And the EPE is going to be fifty dollars for number one, and fifty dollars for number two, and ENE is again fifty dollars and fifty dollars. So let's say the market goes and rises by Q. Um, we're going to, for number one, we'll report a $100 profit, pay a $100 dividend, or number two, have a $100 loss. We'll get a $100 capital injection from the mythical holding company. And the balance sheet after the market move is pretty simple. We've got a receivable of $100 from one, payable with number $100 to number two, no net funding need, and we're over. Okay, let's make it a little more complicated. Transaction number two is a bilateral collateral mark, threshold of zero and instantaneous payment on the Transaction. So the market moves to Q again. So number one, we have a $100 profit, we pay a $100 dividend. Transaction number two, $100 loss, received a $100 capital contribution, and we post $100 of capital, pardon me, cash on our payable in order to um, meet our obligations. So let's look at that balance sheet. We have a receivable $100 from counterparty number one, a payable of $100, counterparty number two, and a receivable of hundred dollars from counterparty number two for the collateral we posted to them. The adroit accountant will notice that the balance sheet does not balance at this moment. 
That's because we need debt financing for $100, essentially, to finance the collateral payment we just made a moment ago, <coughs> collateralized transaction. So we see here that the, um, the EPE and the ENE are not exactly predictors of the cash flows. Recall that the EPE was $50, and $50 was also the ENE on number one. On number two, the EPE, let's go back and look at those. Transaction number one was EPE of 50, ENE of 50, and number two was zero and zero. Here the market moved by a Q and we've got a $100 receivable. So that the funding, although on average the EPE and the ENE mark what the receivables and payables are, the actual day-to-day -day receivable or payable is going to depend on the market move. So that from the treasurer's perspective, the market move will drive the short-term cash fluctuations, even if the EP and the ENE were, still remain as statistically valid estimators of the long-term assets and liabilities in the business, the short-term funding swings will not exactly match those EPEs and ENEs. Again, going back to that point, $100 of excess funding was just as likely as the $100 of cash we had to post out. So that um, at this moment, we see those short-term costs occurring. Now let's just go back on this transaction and assume now that the market move is expected to be permanent rather than just that one day move of Q, which we saw a moment ago. Here, we now update the EPEs and ENEs to reflect our view that that market move is permanent so that the counterparty number one is going to lose $100 permanently and counterparty number two, because they're collateralized, will have no EPE or ENE in any case. So what's happened here is that short-term funds flow we saw in the first example has essentially now turned into a long-term funds flow. And we see now that once the EPE goes to $100, we now illustrate this is really not a short-term funding issue. This has turned into a long-term funding issue. And so in some sense, we have the longer-term view, which essentially get out of your simulation models will tell you that exposure amounts, and those exposure amounts are not just credit exposure amounts, those are funding requirement amounts in their expectation. And it's a, uh, an art for the treasurer to balance the short-term cash flows with the longer-term knowledge, and the, and the treasurer actually is out money on these trades, because the treasurer has to raise long-term debt to finance the receivable, the good news is they have long-term liabilities coming in uh, on the payables, so the net long-term debt will be the net of the two numbers, but that doesn't keep the short-term cash flows from driving the treasurer crazy. <coughs> we switch now to the credit risk analysis. And by the way, <coughs> I'm to sort of quantify the points I just made on the funding. Let's take a look at the credit risk analysis for a moment. And to say the obvious, we take credit risk and receive from the counterparty, and the counterparty has credit risk for us when they're on the payable we go to them. Now, each counterparty is looking at this credit cost, and the credit cost, again, as we've seen before, is the sum of the net present value of the counterparty spread, and by that I mean the forward CBS spread, the EPE, expected positive exposure and the survival probability of the counterparty to that time period. Um, I'm ignoring for the moment rebalancing costs to actually go and hedge those exposures. Now, during a price negotiation, it's a no-brainer that sophisticated parties will settle on the net of the two credit charges. That is to say, neither party can achieve what they want to offset their own cost of credit and the pricing is always going to be on a bilateral basis. So I fully agree with David that when you go to price transactions, you leave money on the table if you're not thinking bilaterally as you price them, and that pricing also goes for unwinds. So the transaction begins and ends, you'll be on a bilateral basis. I'm focusing on a little bit different issue than pricing on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. I'm focusing on the actual economics of the trade over its lifetime if you actually hold it. 
to its maturity. So let's take a look at those actual economics over the lifetime of the trade. Let's just imagine for a moment a derivative trade with a counterparty with the same rating as ours. Uh, there'll be no net credit payments. The deal will be priced at mid-market. And uh, since we're a, a, a hedger like David, we're going to buy a credit default swap to hedge the counterparty credit risk. And we may go through rebalancing of that swap. But to oversimplify the example, the risk-free flows are going to have a zero NPV to the firm, ex ante. And the credit default swap cost has to be paid. So at that point, we're net negative. Over the life of the trade, there is no profit on our own debt. So you can skip that as a source of value to make this trade balance, so that the result is the total transaction produces a loss over its life, and nobody <coughs> will actually change that lifetime loss. So again, if you're a bilateralist, this bilateral pricing has led to the notion that your own liabilities on the derivative book should be marked to market using your own, uh, probably, CDS spread. Um, and that has led many banks to actually discuss the mark to market value of their own liabilities. Um, if you have that view of the world, <coughs> that you create profits when your debt sells for less than par, you are in pig heaven right now. <laughs> Our debt has never sold for such a low value. Not just speaking just for my firm. This is something we can share with the whole market. And I feel really good about something we've created as a group, <coughs> which is debt selling below par. And I'm speaking to the bilateral model here. And I'm surprised our senior managers haven't been more congratulatory about this source of profit <laughs> that they've created. If this, whole se if this all seems a bit irrational, it actually is. Um, if, if your reaction is that <coughs> having your debt sell below market is not a good thing, it's actually a sign of a bad thing, then that's your intuition telling you the bilateral model may have a flaw. And let me just go through what the, the flaw is here. In order to make a profit on your debt, if it sells at a discount, you've got four options to, to make big money. The first one is to go bankrupt. <laughs> because if you go bankrupt, people will not collect the money you owe them, and you collect on that profit. Um, that's, that's option number one. And it's, it's amazing how neither we nor the government want that to happen. You can take cash and buy back your debt when it's below par. And that actually is not unknown. It can happen from time to time. Having said that, when the, when the crisis hits, the notion of taking short-term cash and using it to pay off long-term debt it is literally the opposite of what your treasurer is trying to accomplish. You're trying to keep that debt out there. And um, so, you know, cash becomes more and more precious as that spread widens. You could issue new debt and buy back your old debt at a discount, which, of course, it would take you a moment to, to figure out the NTV of that trade is zero. So that's not going to add any value, although it does extinguish the old debt. It merely is an NPV zero. And finally, you can sell your business. Because the purchaser would buy at the bilateral price, going back to the point that the bilateral always dictates the price. Of course, nobody's advocating that for their own bank. And secondly, in this kind of a market, when debt spreads are that depressed, there are no buyers here. So you can see that all four options don't really give you the value creation you thought you had. A moment ago. The conclusion is the bilateral model is a liquidation model, and for that reason it's a fine pricing model, but it's not a very good model in a going concern world. So if you intend to stay in business, the unilateral model reflects the economics to you. That doesn't mean it reflects the economics of pricing the transaction, it just means it reflects the economics of holding the transaction and running the business. Now I've got an example here using an SPE in which we put two trades, one trade with counterparty number one and one with counterparty number two, and they're exactly offsetting trades without any collateral. But this is an example you really can take a look at at, uh, you know, at your own convenience. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip that example on pages 10 and 11. And if you're an IFE member, you can kind of you know, go online and uh, take a look at this. Let's just summarize here with the value of the derivative transaction, <coughs> the traditional bilateral view, 
as it's currently done in some firms, and then combine you of funding and credit, which I just described, you got the credit risk of the counterparty, which is the sum of essentially it's the it's the CBA at inception using the CDS spread on the counterparty, and the the combined view of funding and credit. That that's exactly right. That's that's the cost of the EPE. Then there's the benefit of your own default risk, and in a bilateral view, it's the sum of those things times your own CDS spread, which reflects your counterparty view of the cost of exposure to you. In the combined view of funding and credit, if you talk about the profits of the business on an ongoing basis, that's zero. That doesn't provide a benefit. They have a cost, but their cost doesn't provide you a benefit as long as you stay in business. Then we have the funding costs are receivable in the traditional bilateral view that's ignored. In the combined view of funding and credit, you take that EPE and that is valued at your own bond spread because you have to raise debt to finance that long-term receivable. The maturity of the debt would have to match the maturity of the receivable. The good news is there's a funding benefit of the payable, which is your own bond spread times the ENE. I, by the way, left out the appropriate survival probabilities in the interest of uh, simplicity. To one significant digit, these approaches come out with a big difference. The, to one significant digit, the difference between the combined view and the traditional view is the funding cost of receivable is ignored in the traditional view, but included in the combined view. <coughs> and we're going to use the discovery of zero for simplicity because this is a simple example. And we're going to talk about the good days and today in terms of different spreads you might use to evaluate the economics of this trade. Um, and you can see what those spreads are there. They're obviously a lot lower in the good old days than today. I notice also in the old good old days, the CDS spread was kind of the same as the bond spread, and today it's not. Bond spreads are outside of CDS spreads. To express a point of disagreement with David Lamb, there's a huge difference between bond spreads and CDS spreads, and you don't want to confuse them structurally. A CDS spread prices default loss. A bond spread prices default loss and the just the inability to finance a trade. It's the best indicator of the cost of the liquidity risk rather than the cost of credit risk. And if you actually get into economic capital modeling, we've got a very valuable discussion to separately consider the hedging costs and economics of hedging credit risk and hedging liquidity risk in the market. Uh, rolling right along for this example, um, in the traditional bilateral view, we have a cost of the CBA of 25 uh, in this case, $1,000. The liability CBA is $2,500,000. <coughs> and it's substantially lower just because the bank's borrowing cost is a lot lower than this counterparty CDS spread. Um, leading in, since we don't consider the funding cost and all the equity, we have a lot, uh, you know, $22,500 um, cost we, we need to uh, recover in pricing with the counterparty to make up for this cost over the the credit cost of the deal. The credit and the funding view is not a tremendous amount different because the bank's borrowing costs are so low. We see here the funding cost of the receivable and the funding benefit of the payable are relatively small compared to the credit cost of the CDA. So that we might, uh, in a price <coughs> sense, the, the difference might not be all that material um, up front. <coughs> Today, though, the, the, you know, the views are different. You know, spreads are perhaps four times as high, and banks' borrowing costs have gone very high, um, particularly over the three-year mark where the Treasury guarantees um, stop. In the traditional bilateral view, we again skip the funding aspect to this, and we have a larger receivable cost up due to larger spreads and larger liabilities CBA. So that instead of looking to recover something like 22 in pricing, you look to recover something like 50 in that bilateral view. Again, the bilateral drives pricing. Um, if you include funding costs, though, you get a really good <coughs> view of it. We've got the same CDA of receivables, but now it's $150,000 worth of, you might say, upfront cost to lock in the long-term debt to finance that receivable. <coughs> 
Now, the good news is you get a $75,000 benefit from them buying your long-term debt in the form of that statistical payable. But that net difference here of uh, $75,000 gives you a, a very different view of the economics of the trade than you would have gotten if you left the funding costs out. So um, leaving funding costs out um, would be a big mistake as you think about trade economics. So um, that's it from the three of us in terms of formal presentation. Um, I guess we can take questions at this point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One thing. Uh, I should have said is that in case you don't know it, GAAP accounting now requires firms implement the bilateral CDA so that this is no longer simply uh, you know, a theoretical issue. The reason firms have to implement it, and as, as David said, given how <coughs> wild both credit spreads on obligors and one's own firm's credit spreads have changed if the CBA isn't hedged, it's, it creates billions of dollars of swings in marked market value. It can completely drown out, in fact, the change in the value of the underlying derivatives, which can be, you know, traditionally have been fairly easy to hedge. So this is why uh, that would have, I should have said that before David spoke to kind of create a context about why hedging the CBA is as important as it is. Well, we're open up for questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Is there a mic? Or then just speak loud. I'll speak loud. Um, whenever uh, questions of spread come up, what I'm always interested in is, given the multiple structure of compounding and conditional probability, what's the argument for using arithmetic uh, spreads rather than geometric spreads uh, w w when you're going to use these in out-of-sample situations, like in hedging, where you're projecting things into the future. So even if you're looking at this as, I'm only looking at the Greeks and everything, but how, what, what gets projected, it'll be very different if you defined it geometrically or more complicated than that, than defining it simply as arithmetic. So what's the argument for using arithmetic? Is it just simplicity, or is there some deeper reason here? I, I guess I... In, in one's looking at the sensitivity that the CBA has to the market observables and, and hedging accordingly. So one I'm not sure there's anything else. Yeah. The, the basic question is maybe your question is how is the CBA valued? Because if the CBA is valued in the way we've all described, then the way that's hedged follows, right? Because the way you hedge is dependent on how a quantity is valued. So, so the hedge is a projection into the future. That's why no, you're hedging. No, no, it's, no. it's hedging the... Well, that's why you're hedging. You're hedging because you want the future to come out okay. So if you're doing that, when you're saying that the, 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 that the spread is, is an arithmetic difference, you're saying that something about Arith arithmeticity is the correct thing to project into the future rather than, for instance, a geometric definition of a hedge or, as I said, something more complicated. Well, I, I, again, I, I think generally one hedges to, to various scenarios and whatever, you know, and often the hedges are fairly similar depending on the different scenarios that one is projecting to get you from one day to the next. I, I think that the, 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 the simple spread difference is just for argument's sake. The, the actual price in the <coughs> are, you know, geometric <coughs> or, uh, calculation just take, taking into account uh, the, the, the margin of for profit. Are there other questions we can have a discussion after, perhaps? Other, uh, Martin? If when you're, um, trying to hedge this CBA, not in the good old days, but like now where a lot of the markets have dried up and, and uh, people may not be willing to take your credit for entering into whatever hedges, is is there uh, 
is it still possible to do the sort of hedging you're referring to, or is is there a liquidity issue with those hedges? By, by and large, I think it's 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 still working. Obviously, in the default swap market, there is uh, times when there's very little liquidity. In the the commercial mortgage backed market, there was, as far as I can see, no liquidity for the entire month of December. But Things, things seem to be fairly reasonable now if, if one's not trying to do large size. Yes, uh, I have a question regarding the CDA liability and the uh, founding benefit. So, when we have a net payable to the counterparty, we have CDA liability, right? Yeah. Did you say separately we have a founding benefit also? Well, that liability is no different than long term debt. Yeah. It's on the liability side of the balance sheet, and it represents the, the fact that they're going to give you, statistically speaking, sorry, you're going to owe them money, statistically speaking, and not give them cash for it right away. And so in that sense, it's no different than long-term debt. Right. But wouldn't that have some double counting if you have the default CDL activity and funding benefit? Well, let's put it this way. You have He's not advocating both. Well, the CDA liability is the principal amount in which you get a funding benefit. So you multiply that liability amount by your own bond spread to say what you would have had to do with a bond to raise that much money. <coughs> now, often that is merely a fraction of the amount of money it costs you to raise the long-term debt to finance the receivables on the asset side. So you have to look at them both together in terms of the gross impact to the fund. But again, it's just think of it as loans and deposits. Just just get simple. I mean, they're statistical. I and mean, we talk about EPEs and ENEs. Just things like you know, we're in the deposit business and the borrowing business. What are the economics of those businesses in terms of funding costs and benefits? Yes. Uh, yeah. This is a question perhaps for for Charles. Uh, it may not be just a question, probably a clarification. Your, your founding argument for CBA is, uh, really assumes that uh, the, uh, the uh, health of the maturity, right? So if CV is a hedge, then obviously it does not require any founding. Right? If CBA is a hedge. Are you talking about the, the, the receivables and payables considered as sources and uses of cash? Are you talking about the credit spread on the receivables and payables as something we need to hedge. Yeah, if, I mean the, the argument you make assumes that you know the, uh, the payable and receivable actually help to mature. Obviously, in that yeah. case, I, I agree with you. But if CVS actually hedge today, then obviously there's no uh, no need for for, for funding uh, concern. Not well, so hedging the, the credit risk does not eliminate the funding flows. That's an important point. They're, they're just two. Di they're orthogonal dimensions. You might say we got credit risk, which we've hedged, and you've got funding flows, which will occur, and which you have to pre-fund. You might say, in order to manage risk responsibly in the treasury, if you have long-term uses of funds, you've got to have long-term sources of funds, and those long-term sources and uses have nothing to do with hedging or not hedging credit exposure or market prices. Yes, back there. I have a question. Then, then in your in your margin calculations, or in your calculations when you're netting the middle of the margin, then would you then also bake into account the cost of funding on your own as well? Because as an example, when you're creating a liability and you're posting margin interim, right? There's a cost of funding implicit in that in that margin, right? Now, many times you uh, you may or may not <coughs> bake that in because you may look at that margin as just some sort of threshold that's inside there and it comes out net in that time period. Should you actually make that into that portion of the equation as well? Absolutely. I mean, just to be honest, if you have a bunch of trades that you know are sort of going all over the place, and they've got a really high credit rating, you've got a low credit rating, do not push for a margin agreement because you're getting rid of a valuable funding source, statistically speaking, and you may find out that you've 
you know, I, I hate to argue against collateral agreements, because we all love collateral agreements. But, you know, funding is funding, and these days long-term funds are not easy to raise. I'm speaking you know, as, a, as a pure economic matter as opposed to a responsible risk management matter. And just, you need to understand the value of what you give away when you sign a collateral agreement. The one point I'd like to make, it's not clear right now how one makes that in and, and still stays well, in good terms with your accountants, right? Yeah, that's why I was questioning. Yeah. I mean, one's a theoretical, one's pure cash flow, which is clear, but the other, which actually gets charged to the business in theory as long as they're borrowing and they have to put margin on it anyhow. But in terms of your calculation, it's a different, it's, it, that also might have to be considered. Again, we focus so intensely on credit. I'm essentially trying to say, don't forget the value of the funds flows in cash terms. You just have to look at them both and get a holistic picture. Maybe that's charges. Yeah. Maybe that it comes out of the wash of the business cost of the business. Yes. With the uh, gap being uh, bilateral, in your analysis is kind of indicating that a unilateral analysis is, is more relevant. How do you reconcile the two? I think the easiest reconciliation is as follows. The gap analysis is a useful analysis for pricing. But when we do a transaction evaluation over its life, people sort of are willing to consider the positive CBA up front, but don't can take into account the locked-in bleed on the theta on your own liabilities. Because as long as you don't prepay them, you're, you're bleeding your own spread every day. So when you go and hedge the asset, that's fine. I mean, there's credit risk in the asset. But a lot of people don't sort of say there's a guarantee. If you stay in business, the MPV of your bleed on the theta is a positive mark on the liability on day one. Taken together, the theta's NPV and the liability is zero. Now, if, if, if for pricing purposes and accounting purposes, you want to recognize the timing differences on that, that's fine. It does match the pricing as David has said. The, 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 I'll try to say it a, a different way. The, the, right now, the, the bilateral view of the world without funding, like it or not, it, is what flows through books and records. There, I think, are, are very valid points around how do we bake funding into this, and if we if we dream up another funding charge, call it whatever, whatever acronym you like, how do we, how do we, you know, charging for that for the counterparty up front is sort of the, the easy part. That's just them, you know, adjusting the terms of the trade so you're compensated for that future funding. Putting that number somewhere in your books and records so you'll actually be able to, you know, take care of that, that, that bleed on the other side is, is I, I think a bit where the challenge is right now. It's a big job. We'll say in our terms of internal discussions on how to make these ideas come true, all of the funds accounting today is on, is on a cool basis. So the cost of your long-term debt is on a cool basis. The notion of the NPV of the cost of your is getting beyond the accounting model. So it's not easy to talk about the economic implications in a way that dovetails nicely with the accounting model. One more question, if there is any. Uh, why don't you have a comment? I mean, why would you, you know, make money on your CD liability without going uh, bankruptcy? You know, which I observed happened recently is if I'm a payable to my counterparty and I, you know, my credit spread is not so wide and uh, you know, the counterparty is smart by my people, they come to me to unwind. And your treasurer goes crazy when you do that. Because they are losing a valuable long-term source of funds. Your treasurer should not be applauding profits from unwinding trades. Because it, it depends on how much cash you're sitting on. Exactly. Because there's a technical reason for the CDS to be white. Right? Not necessarily, you know, your fundamental sort of cash. Immediately, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, project actually by unwinding. But just keep in mind, when you unwind, you're losing long-term financing. And that's not something that people are finding easy to find in the market today. But if you can, if you can price it aggressively, if you, can. You, are, you are absolutely making real money. I agree. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your attention. <laughs>